you're a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, you need a bit of a reset. There, there is a possibility on the other side of this that that uh, inflation could be could actually be quite. Welcome hot. back to Real Estate Mindset. Today's video is going to be a comprehensive, detailed breakdown on FHA guidelines and regulations for residential mortgages. Now I've been a loan officer for 22 years and I probably reviewed something like a thousand loans. And so today I'm going to break down FHA guidelines and make it as simple as possible to understand. Now, what's very interesting about FHA, you guys, is the fact that in almost every scenario, if you plan on putting the minimum down, it's actually cheaper to get FHA versus conventional. And so today we're gonna go over guidelines for credit. We're gonna go over guidelines for income. We'll go over guidelines for down payment, loan limits, mortgage insurance. And we're also gonna do a comparison towards the end of the video, comparing FHA loans to conventional mortgages and I think your mind is going to be blown away once you find out that's actually generally much cheaper to do an FHA mortgage and I'm also going to include where to go if you have a very complicated question about FHA loans as a loan officer we would go to a website called all regs if we ever had a complicated question that we had to ask and so I'm really looking forward to this video I absolutely love talking about loans but I want to make a point I definitely believe when we look at the price and when we look at the payment and when we look at the equity growth overall, the housing market is extremely toxic. And so if you're really going to become a winner in this housing market, you're going to have to do a great job at understanding local market trends. And obviously, if you're on the sideline, work on your purchasing power. Again, your credit, your income, and your assets. Now let's start by going over the general FHA loan requirements, and then I'm gonna break this down into more detail. Now the FHA stands for Federal Housing Administration. They provide mortgage insurance. They're not guaranteeing loans like VA. They are just insuring it. Now those are loans made by FHA approved lenders. So the FHA is not lending you money. FHA insures these loans on single family and multifamily homes in the United States and its territories. In its latest insurer of residential mortgages in the world, insuring tens of millions of properties since 1934 when it was created. Now, again, you guys, here's a general breakdown. Now, basically, you need a FICO score of at least 580. Now, if you have that, the minimum down payment requirement is 3.5% down. Now, if you have a FICO score between 500 and 579, you could still get a loan so long as you have 10% down. But let me tell you guys something right now. If your FICO score is under 580, you probably should take a break and increase your credit score. Now, the one thing that conventional has over FHA is the fact that conventional mortgage insurance goes away. With FHA, mortgage insurance does not go away unless you have 10% down. It goes away in 11 years. Now, with conventional, it's called PMI. With FHA, it's called MIP, which stands for mortgage insurance premium. Now, this says that the debt to income ratio maximum is 43%. That's wrong. It's actually 46 over 56.99. I'll get into that in a minute. Now, here's something that's very important, you guys. The home must be your primary residence, okay? So to be very clear, this is not an investment loan. This is only to get your primary residence. Now, personally, I have a lot of experience doing FHA. I mean, if the loan is cheaper, it's easier to get. The interest rate is lower, then why wouldn't we get it? Now let's talk about credit and let's talk realistically and not just like these black and white guidelines. The magic credit score for FHA is 640 and above. If your credit score is under 640, you're gonna get hit with massive fees and massive penalties. It is very difficult to get borrowers approved when their score is under 640. Again, over 640, you can pretty much get away with a lot of different factors. Now, although I'm talking about credit, remember you guys, you don't just need a credit score. You also need your income and your assets, both of which are equally as important as having a credit score that gets you to qualify for a loan. But again, your magic score is 640. Now for FICO scores between 620 and 639, 
it's still fairly easy to get the loan, but you're going to get, again, massively penalized. Anything between 580 and 619 is very, very difficult to get. Your interest rate is going to be high. They're going to charge you a lot of money just to get the loan. So in my opinion, what people should be doing before they get a home is have a minimum credit score, minimum credit score of 700. You can actually save a ton of money by having good credit. Now, if your score is under 580, and by the way, you guys, I've never helped anyone with an FHA loan that they had that had a credit score under 580 post Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act. Now, if your score is under 580, you need a minimum of 10% down. But again, you guys, just because you have a 560 and a 10% down payment does not mean you're going to get approved. If you have low credit, but you still have that 10% down payment, you're also going to need something called compensating factors. The lower your credit score, the more important compensating factors are. Now, the most important compensating factor normally is having something called reserves. And generally, FHA wants you to have two to three months of reserves. And what reserves is, is basically you have to have money left over after you close. So you can't spend all of your money moving into the property. And generally that's one month of your mortgage payment, counting principal taxes and insurance, principal interest taxes and insurance. So two months of reserves is basically having two months of mortgage payments after you close. Another thing that they look for is not having any payment shock. And also you guys, another compensating factor is low debt to income ratio. But again, your most important compensating factor is having money. FHA is a lot looser with low credit scores. Again, so long as you have extra money, but that's not all you guys. It's more than just a FICO score. You also have to be careful having any federal debt in default like school loans. If you have any school loans in default or any missed payments, you're going to want to have your loan officer pull something called CAVERS. If your CAVERS comes back and it shows your delinquent on any federal debt, that's automatic grounds for basically being disapproved for FHA. So make sure you're paying on time on your school loans or rather they're not in default. But let's go into a little bit more details as far as credit history and what FHA looks for exactly. And you guys, I'm gonna have a ton of links in this video for you guys to be able to access if you have more questions and just wanna play with payments. Now, your FHA lender will review your past credit for performance while underwriting your loan. A good track record of timely payments will likely make you eligible for an FHA loan. The following list includes items that can negatively affect your loan eligibility. Now, the first one here, guys, is having no credit history. And I'll tell you right now, having no credit history is way better than having a 400 credit score, bankruptcy, foreclosure, and repo. Now, if you don't have established credit history and don't use traditional credit, your lender must obtain non-traditional merged credit or develop a credit history from other means. Now, that's called alternative trade lines, if they allow you, and this is really actually pretty crazy, and this is really good for first time home buyers, a lot of times they'll allow you to use your rent payment or your utility payment and add that to your actual credit profile so that you get approved and show a credit history. That's one of the crazy things about FHAs. Uh, guys, again, a lot of people think that FHAs are a horrible loan and mostly because of the upfront mortgage insurance premium. But for the people that are first time home buyers that are trying to get in homes when the market is less toxic, this is actually a really good loan. In fact, I personally, after my own mess, my foreclosure repo and bankruptcy, my first house that I bought was with an FHA loan and all I put was three and a half percent down and I made $150,000 on that house once I finally sold it. So in other words, it can be really good. Now, when it comes to bankruptcy, this is the crazy thing. Bankruptcy does not disqualify a borrower from obtaining an FHA mortgage. Now, generally for chapter seven bankruptcy, all you need is a two year 
history. So if you don't have a chapter seven for two years, you can qualify. But again, you guys, there are something called overlays. Overlays are like rules on top of rules. Now what underwriters want to see, if you've had a recent bankruptcy around two years, three years, they want to see established on time credit payments after the bankruptcy. So remember, if you had a bankruptcy, the most important thing generally to do after that is to have timely payments on your remaining credit. All right, so that's a two year history. Now, when it comes to late payments, obviously you guys, late payments are bad. That's gonna drop your FICO score, but take a look at foreclosure. Past foreclosures are not necessarily a roadblock to a new FHA loan, but it depends on your circumstances. Now, generally the rule is four years. That's it. Conventional is way, way worse. Now, when it comes to collections, judgments, and federal debt, generally when it comes to judgments and federal debt, you can still qualify so long as you have a payment schedule. So if you have a federal tax lien, it's okay, again, generally, as long as you have that payment schedule. Now, collections are important to understand. If you have a cumulative total of $2,000 or more in collections, lenders and underwriters will calculate either 1% to 2% of the total balance of your collections as a payment to be calculated against your debt-to-income ratio. So if I have $10,000 of collections, 1% of that would be what? $100. So I would have a $100 calculation against my debt to income ratio. In other words, don't have collections. But if you do, it doesn't automatically disqualify you. And also, you guys never forget that I do have a free, I made this for free home buying course. So if you want more information on credit, go to my free home buying course. Obviously, I have many, many different chapters. I have credit, income, assets, mortgage, the difference between payment, price, what's an investor mindset, wedge basics, cash flow basics, and what to ask a seller for. So I have a lot of stuff here if you guys want some additional information. Okay, guys, now let's talk about debt to income ratio. Now, again, as a loan officer of over two decades, I would say generally debt to income ratio is probably the most difficult thing for loan officers to properly calculate. Now, DTI, again, debt to income ratio, basically looks at two different things. They look at your front end and they look at your back end. Now the maximum front end debt to income ratio generally for FHA is 46%, which means your gross income, it's actually a lot. It's, it's actually crazy if you think about it. 46% of your gross income can go towards paying your mortgage. Again, when we're dealing with W-2 income, they take your gross wages not even your net take home income, they're using your gross wages. 46% of that can go towards paying your mortgage. Now the back end debt to income ratio maximum is all the way up to 56.99%. And what it means by back end ratio, it means your proposed mortgage payment plus all of your debt, like your credit card payments, auto loan payments, school loans, and things of that nature. So you have your front end that only measures your gross income compared to your mortgage payment. That could be about 46%. And then we have your back end, which takes your proposed mortgage payment payment plus all of your debt liabilities, and that can be as high as 56.99%. Now, one compensating factor when it comes to debt to income ratio is having a low debt to income ratio, like under 40%. They absolutely love that, but I find it always so intriguing that they actually use your gross income. Now, pay attention to this next thing because this is very important. Now, when it comes to calculating your bonus, your overtime, commission, a second job, or self-employment, you need a two-year history in order to have that income count to qualify you for a loan. And generally, you cannot have a decrease in that type of income of more than 20 to 25%. If underwriters see that you're making 20 to 25% less from one year to the next, they may not allow you to use that income at all. And so when it comes to self-employed income, whether it's corporate income or Schedule C income, you have to make sure that you're not taking too many deductions because when it comes to self-employment income, the underwriters actually use your net income divided over two 
year. So they'll take income from 2022 and 2023 and they'll divide that and that will be your self-employment income. But one thing I want you guys to remember is again, second job, commission, overtime, bonus, or self-employment, you do need a two-year history, but oftentimes you guys it is very helpful. Now let me explain this as well. You can only use the income for people that are on the loan. So if you have a husband and wife that are both on the loan and you need their income to qualify, understand the FICO score used is whoever has the lower FICO score of the two. So sometimes in order to get a better interest rate, you need a better credit. And sometimes what you can do is you can actually remove someone off of the loan that has the lower credit score so long as the one person can qualify based on debt to income ratio. But again, you guys, one of the most important things to do in advance before even shopping for a house is making sure your loan officer is properly calculating your debt to income ratio. And then after that, sending your file through something called automated underwriting system, which is basically AUS. So you always want to make sure, hey, loan officer, did you run my file through AUS? And then if they say yes, quickly ask them if it was through LP or DU. LP is Freddie Mac, loan prospector, and DU is Fannie Mae desktop underwriter. Both are automated ways to quickly underwrite your loan. So again, you guys, make sure your loan officer is properly calculating your debt to income ratio. And if you really wanna know the difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval, generally a pre-approval is where an underwriter reviews your income in advance of a purchase contract. So I would strongly encourage that if you're out there shopping for a mortgage right now, make sure your loan officer is pre-approving you and having your income reviewed from an actual underwriter. Down payments. Now, Americans seem to struggle heavily with coming up with a down payment for a mortgage. Now, before I go into down payments, let me first explain that there are two out-of-pocket expenses when purchasing a house. Yes, it's your down payment, but it's also closing costs. Now, the good thing is, is on FHA loans, they allow you to have the seller pay up to 6% towards closing costs. And every single home that I have ever purchased in my life, I have had the seller pay every single penny of my closing costs. And closing costs can be $10,000. So just remember that, guys. But regardless, the minimum down payment for FHA is only 3.5%. So on a $100,000 loan, three and a half percent is only $3,500. So it's actually very affordable to get an FHA mortgage. You don't just need a 20% down payment. You can move in for as little as 3.5% down. Now, let me explain to you guys what's really important to understand about the down payment, and that is called sourcing, okay? Because of the Patriot Act, Lenders are now required to review where cash comes from to purchase real estate. And therefore, cash isn't allowed. So if you have mattress money, get it out of your mattress and put it in the bank because you have to source it and you cannot source or prove where it came from. You can't prove where it came from if it's cash. So make sure you're keeping your money in your bank account and you're not transferring your money all over the place. Now, how the sourcing works is generally the loan officers are going to ask you for two months of bank statements and the underwriters are going to review your deposits for 60 days. Now, if they see any deposits, any big deposits, generally over $500, they're going to ask you, hey, where did that money come from? So again, if you have any cash deposits, anything of that nature, make sure it's not within two months of sending your bank statements to the lender. Now, FHA also allows you to get a gift, a gift, as long as it's from a family member to purchase an FHA mortgage. Now, when it comes to sourcing the gifter's funds, because the gifter must prove the same thing. They're only going to go back one month. So to source your funds, they go back two months. To source a gifter's funds, they go back one month. But the thing is, guys, and I also want to make clear, you cannot get debt for a down payment. So you can't go get a credit card or a personal loan to be used for a down payment. That is not allowed. Let's read a little bit more about sourcing down payments. FHA loan rolls do not only regulate the source of funds in this way, it also governs who may provide 
such gifts. Be prepared to provide supporting documentation for the source of any financial gift associated with your home loan transactions. Now, the interesting thing is, is gifts can be provided by a borrower's family member, actually a borrower's employer. And I have seen this. I've seen employers give their employees a bonus or something of those lines to actually move into a house. It's also saying a close friend with a clearly defined and documented interest in the borrower. This one's hard, you guys. Uh, you know, how do you prove someone's your friend? Facebook? Uh, you know, so it can be done. It's a lot more strict though it's if your friend. That's why I say family member, cousin, uncle, aunt, things like that. You can also use a gift from a charitable organization and that's where those down payment assistance programs come in. A government agency or public entity with a program providing home ownership assistance to low or moderate income families or first time home buyers. So in other words, just remember you cannot use cash to buy a house and any money that's used at all to purchase a house must be sourced. It's the law. Now let's go over loan limits. But remember, you guys, I said it must be a primary residence. Now it doesn't just apply to single family residences. You can also purchase a townhouse or condo, although a condo is a little bit tricky. And you can actually purchase a multiple unit up to four units with an FHA so long as you live there. But regardless, let's go into loan limits. Now what's important to understand is there's low cost areas and there's high cost areas. Now there's a map of this. Now essentially what this represents you guys is the maximum loan limits for the type of property, whether it's for a single family residence that counts condo and townhouses or a duplex, triplex or fourplex. That's right you guys, you can buy a fourplex with an FHA mortgage. This is one of the best ways in a normal housing market to house hack. If I can start over again, my first house would be a fourplex. I would move into there as a primary residence and I would have made a bunch of money. But look at the difference between low cost and high cost. In the low cost area, your maximum loan amount for an SFR is 420. But for the high cost area, the maximum loan amount is 970,000. Maximum loan amount for a fourplex is somehow 1.8 million. That's crazy to me. Whereas the low cost area, it's 809,000. So your maximum loan amount is important, but it should not prohibit you from purchasing a primary residence. Now let's talk about mortgage insurance. Now remember, generally the only advantage of getting a conventional mortgage, again, the only advantage, only advantage of a conventional mortgage over an FHA is the mortgage insurance. And so I think it's important to start talking about mortgage insurance. Understand with FHA, your mortgage insurance never goes away unless you have 10% down. If you have 10% down, your mortgage insurance will go away after 11 years. Now, again, with conventional, it's called PMI, which stands for private mortgage insurance. For FHA mortgage insurance, it's called mortgage insurance premium or MI. P. Now, recently, FHA actually lowered the mortgage insurance, you guys, almost under conventional, it's crazy, of a rate of 0.55% annually. And I'll pull up a payment calculator to show you how that works. But in addition to your monthly mortgage, and again, this is why sometimes, and this is why a lot of people think conventional is better, you also have to pay an upfront MIP fee of 1.75%. They tax you heavily. The good news about the upfront mortgage insurance premium is that it can be rolled into the loan. Let me show you. Bear with me real quick, guys. This is an FHA loan calculator that will be linked in my description. Now, first of all, I'm highlighting the upfront FHA MIP fee. Now you guys can see here, basically the house price is 300,000. The loan amount with the upfront mortgage insurance premium is actually 294,750. So this is the upfront mortgage insurance premium right here. You can see that's 1.75% of the loan, but that is rolled back into the loan and I'm able to tax deduct that on my taxes. But regardless, you need to understand that there is that upfront free. Now the monthly fee is right here at 0.55% for a $300,000 house. That means your monthly mortgage insurance is $132 each and every month. Now, before we go in to compare FHA versus conventional, let's now talk about the property condition. A lot of people are like, oh, FHA must do an inspection. The reality is, is FHA does require inspection, but that to be done by an appraiser. Now, an appraiser is only going to look at things you know, based on their blind eye. And really what is important when it comes to FHA is that the property is in livable condition. There's no holes in the ceiling. There's no water stains. There's no rotted wood and things of that nature. Let's read a little more. FHA loans include a process in which a HUD 
approved appraiser must access the property to verify its market value and compliance with HUD's basic property standards. Now, some of these standards are, it must be structurally sound. It must not have any significant defects or incomplete renovations. It has adequate drainage and irrigation. It provides a safe and livable environment with working heating, plumbing, and electric. It has adequate lighting and ventilation in all the rooms and is free from hazards inside and outside of the home. Now we're going to move into the comparison of FHA versus conventional. I'm going to tell you guys up front, if you're only doing the down payment, FHA is cheaper in almost every single situation. Unless you have a 760 FICO score and over, generally it is much cheaper for two reasons. Okay. The first reason is, is generally the mortgage insurance premium is actually lower with FHA when compared to conventional. And on top of the mortgage insurance premium being lower, the interest rate is also lower with FHA. So you have two things that are lower again, unless you have a 760 and above credit score. Let's start doing some comparisons. Again, you guys, this is going to be linked in my description. If you want to fill out your own payment estimate, I absolutely love using these calculators. They are hundred percent free. Now you guys can see, I put in a $300,000 home down payment. Minimum is three and a half percent, which totals $10,500. This is a 30 year loan. I'm using a 6% interest rate. We're calculating the upfront mortgage insurance premium of 1.75%, which equals 52.50. This is a 6% interest rate again, and this is 0.55 percent MIP. So that's your mortgage insurance premium. I'm also putting $5,000 in annual property taxes and $1,800 in homeowners insurance. Now, when I calculate this, you guys can see that the monthly payment is right here. Okay. So our first example is the monthly payment of $2,466. Okay. So right now for a $300,000 house at a 6% interest rate with the property taxes and insurance, the payment is $2,466. Now let's do the same scenario with conventional and let's see what the payment is. But remember you guys, in addition to the payment, understand it's more expensive generally to purchase conventional because it has 5% down. So if you get conventional, generally you're going to pay more money out of your pocket. Okay, so here's our conventional breakdown right here. And you guys can see that the conventional monthly payment is higher. It's $2,640, which means it is $175 more per month to get a conventional mortgage, plus it's an additional $4,500 out of your pocket. Now you can see that here. Here's all of the same stuff. Look at $300,000 loan, 5% down payment, 30 year term, but the interest rate is higher. Do you see that 6.75 plus your PMI is higher at 0.9. Now this is at a 700 credit score. The higher your credit score, the lower your PMI, the lower your credit score, the higher your PMI. So this is at 700 to 719. Your payment, you guys, is $175 more getting a conventional. So again, only time it really makes sense to get conventional is if you have more than the minimum down payment and you have a 760 or higher credit score. Now I'm going to show you guys somewhere to go. If you have a very complicated question pertaining to FHA, something that I always used to do and the underwriters used to do is go to a site to access something called all regs. Let me show you. Okay. So this is going to be linked in my description. This is allregs.com. All you guys do is you put the keyword in here. Like if you put rental income, you hit search and you guys get several different breakdowns, announcement and articles about rental income. Do you see this? This is what we used all the time to figure out really, really specific intimate details. And there is a lot of information on rental income. So again, if you guys have very, very specific questions, this is where you come to, whether you're a loan officer, even underwriters come Come to allregs.com. And again, this will be linked in my description. Okay, guys, that's going to conclude this video. Don't forget to take my free home buying course where I'm going to enhance basically everything that we talked about. I'll do additional breakdowns. And I always get people that I get about 50 emails after doing videos like this. Travis, do you have a referral? Do you have a referral? Oh my gosh, help me find a referral. You guys, I know people in Texas. Unfortunately, it's just Texas. And I want to say one more thing. Generally, you get a lower interest rate when you shop with a broker 
versus a direct lender. Generally, direct lenders have higher overhead and therefore they pad their interest rates, making their interest rates higher. But if you guys do need a referral, all you do, you go to Google, you search you search loan offices in your area, look for reviews. But if you're in my area, feel free to shoot me an email. And other than that, if you guys are out there investing in real estate, you already know I wish you luck and I hope you win.